Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Philosophical Transactions B has published a themed issue organised by Stephen Scaper and Vincenzo Di Marzo on endocannabinoids in nervous system health and disease. Today I'm talking with one of the authors, Morris Elphick, a Professor of Physiology and Neuroscience at Queen Mary University of London. Morris, can you explain to us how the field of cannabinoid research expanded post-1964 when THC was first isolated? So, the endeavour to try and identify the active ingredient of, of cannabis, psychoactive ingredient of cannabis, began uh, a long time ago, uh, long before the discovery of THC itself in 1964. But as you say, t 1964 was the key turning point because in, in, in that year, uh, Raphael Meshulam in Israel determined that delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol is the main psychoactive constituent of cannabis. And this was a key breakthrough in ca cannabis research because now for the first time it was possible to begin to understand how the drug cannabis affects the brain. Now one of the difficulties of working with THC when it was, when it was discovered was its uh, lack of solubility in water. It's a very hydrophobic compound. And that made it a very difficult compound to study in terms of its mode of action. But gradually as time progressed, it became apparent that there was an indication that uh, THC might actually be being, might, might actually be interacting with uh, a specific protein. And the concept then of a so-called cannabinoid receptor emerged in the field. Another key breakthrough came about 20 years later. You get an idea of the time span here, 20 years before the next key breakthrough came. And that was the development of analogues of THC, which were much less hydrophobic, or much, much more able to dissolve in solution and be used experimentally. And it was the development of, of one of these compounds that ultimately led to the, the proof that there is indeed present in the brain a specific receptor protein that THC is interacting with, a so-called cannabinoid receptor. So by the early 1990s, we had progressed to a point where we knew that they were present in the body receptor proteins, G protein coupled receptors, two forms, CB1 and CB2, the, who, that are activated by THC and by other so-called cannabinoids. Um, and this was really a very exciting phase in, in the field of the research because it was really uh, demonstrating not only how cannabinoids work, so how THC as an active component of cannabis might exert its effects in the body, but also it was clear that if these proteins were present in the brain, they must have, within, they must be present in the body and in the brain, natural endogenous uh, cannabinoids that would be activating these proteins under physiological conditions, because clearly receptors don't evolve just so that people can then use recreational drugs to activate them. We know that from the story of, 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 of heroin or morphine, where the work on, on those uh, drugs led to the discovery of en endogenous peptides as, as ligands for those receptors. So by analogy, about a decade after the discovery of opiate receptors, cannabinoid receptors were discovered and then began this search for endogenous cannabinoids, endocannabinoids, the putative endogenous ligands for these uh, receptors. Within two years uh, of the discovery of the cannabinoid receptor, the very first endogenous cannabinoid was isolated from the brain. Um, chemically, it's arachidonyl ethanolamide. It's a rather long name, difficult to, to, to say, but it was given the, a shorter name, which is anandamide. And this was the very first uh, endogenous cannabinoid to be identified. It binds to cannabinoid receptors. It will, to some extent, mimic the action of, of, of THC. And then just a few years later, a second endocannabinoid was discovered, and this is 2-arachidonyl glycerol, uh, also just abbreviated to 2-AG. Uh, and uh, so by 1995, when 2-AG was discovered, we knew then that there were cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, and we knew that there were at least two endogenous cannabinoids that, they, that would activate these, um, these proteins. So research in the field of endocannabinoid signaling has expanded rapidly. Could you explain to us some of the key sub-themes that arise in this themed issue? Sure. Um, so. The discovery of endocannabinoids, as I said earlier, led to the search for a role for these molecules. And one of the themes that this, this special issue focuses on is this uh, body of work that has developed over the last decade or, so, decade or so, which has revealed a fundamental role for endocannabinoids in, so -called, in mechanisms of synaptic plasticity in the brain. Around about 10 years ago, or in fact just over 10 years ago, uh, the idea emerged that 
one potential role for endocannabinoids, in, at least in the brain, was to act as mediators of what's called retrograde signaling. And th what, what this means is that at synapses in the brain, endocannabinoids are being produced postsynaptically and acting presynaptically. Now, our classical view of how neurotransmission works is that a, is a neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic terminal and then acts on the postsynaptic cell. But uh, the idea that there might be molecules that communicate back across the synapse was already around. Uh, but uh, th around about the year 2000, when these ideas were first being postulated, uh, there was no actual evidence that, um, that endocannabinoids might subserve such a role. But various bits of data were sort of pointing to that possibility. Um, so work, in fact, that my lab did and a number of other labs did showed, in, for example, that the the brain cannabinoid receptor, the CB1 receptor, seems to be exclusively located on the presynaptic side of, of, of synapses in the brain. Many synapses, not all synapses, but many in many regions of the brain. In 2001, in fact on the same day, March the 29th, 2001, three papers were published which clearly proved that this is indeed the case. That there is an endocannabinoid being synthesized postsynaptically and then acting presynaptically to in fact inhibit the release of neurotransmitter. What didn't get established for sure at that stage in, in the work was the precise identity of the endocannabinoid that was serving this role of mediating communication retro in a retrograde fashion across the synapse. And, and one of the themes that's highlighted in this uh, issue is the body of work that has led to the demonstration that it's in fact 2-AG, 2-arachidonoglycerol, that seems to be particularly important in subserving this role. Um, and that then perhaps leaves the question, well, if 2AG is doing that job, what's an andamide doing? And uh, Vincenzo De Marzo, in, in his article in, in, in this review uh, issue, um, discusses that. He gets into some detail about the, what are the roles of, of 2AG versus an andamide. So in, in this uh, special issue, that there are attempts to, to focus on, on both the uh, physiology, if you like, of the endocannabinoid system, understanding its role in the nervous system, um, as well as thinking about how we might manipulate it for therapeutic applications. Another theme that emerges in this special issue is around the risks associated with exposure to cannabinoids. Of course, if we're going to use them therapeutically, this is a very important question. But of course, people have been exposing them to cannabinoids for hundreds of years when people have been smoking cannabis. And so that's another theme that's um, uh, discussed in this, in this special issue. And how do you think the field of endocannabinoid research will continue to expand? So I think one of the most exciting possible areas for future research will be to gain a deeper understanding of the structure of the cannabinoid receptors that uh, endocannabinoids interact with. The Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, this year was awarded for work done in determining the structure of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, are also G-protein coupled receptors, um, but at the moment we don't really have a detailed understanding of their molecular structure, not at the atomic level, which is the ultimately the level of, of understanding you need to have. Uh, if you're going to make real progress in using structural information to design drugs, for example. So uh, I would anticipate, given the progress that's been made in determination of the, of the crystal, structure, um, crystal structures of G-protein coupled receptors in recent times, that the CB1 receptor in particular, and perhaps the CB2 receptor as well, will have their uh, crystal structures determined sometime in the next year or two or three, who knows. I, mean, I would be very surprised if there aren't many labs right now working on it. Um, uh, and when, those, when that information becomes available, then it might become feasible for chemists to rationally design molecules that will interact with the receptor. And it may be then possible to design compounds that can interact with the receptor. And possibly it may, it may be possible to uh, uh, design compounds that can have therapeutic actions which without having some of the perhaps undesirable side effects that the THC has, for example, its psychoactivity. So I think just in, in, in a, from a broad perspective, developing compounds that either activate or indeed block the receptor, so antagonists as well, 
So I think that's a very, very exciting potential line of inquiry for future work. I, what I would also predict is that the, our understanding of the physiological role of the endocannabinoid system will continue to grow enormously. So it's very difficult to predict where those breakthroughs will come, but I think we can be sure that given the, how widespread the system is in the, in the brain and in the, in the body generally, that there will be many, many more exciting discoveries made uh, in, in, with respect to the physiological roles of the endocannabinoid system, uh, both within the brain and other aspects of body physiology. But I think it's also important to remember that there are still millions of people around the world who do choose to smoke cannabis recreationally and therefore this field of research will continue to be important for decades to come because it's unlikely people are going to stop smoking cannabis and understanding the cannabinoid system in more, more detail will enable uh, clinicians to make judgments about how we should deal with patients who've had, perhaps been exposed to cannabis excessively at certain stages of their life um, and, and how, how best to, to, to uh, treat them if indeed it does lead to psychological problems or learning problems and so on. So there's th this relevance of the endocannabinoid system to this widely used recreational drug is, is there to stay and uh, therefore uh, it continues to be a very important field of research just purely from the perspective of understanding drug action and dealing with, with, the, with recreational drug use, um, which is a, an, an enduring social problem. So um, there are many avenues in which I think this field will continue to be important uh, into the future. Thank you, Morris. And thank you for watching this Royal Society Publishing video podcast.